Oh, there it is. <clears throat> so did you right. want to start, start over? Or? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, welcome to Back to Wonder WaterCon, day two. Um, we're here with Master George Pratt. Um, he's an illustrator, writer, educator, musician, filmmaker, um, and just all around amazing mark making samurai. So thank you for joining us and yeah, can't, thanks wait for having me. In, can't wait to get into this with you. So yeah, doing great. Uh, it's funny. I, you know, I tell the students because of all this stuff going on that this is a real test for them because it's basically um, artist slash illustrator 101, you know, uh, being quarantined. The only thing different is that you can't go out and eat and you can't hang with your friends like you'd like to or go see movies necessarily. But otherwise, this is a typical day for artists, you know, yeah, musicians, everybody, you know. So uh, same old, same old. <laughs> You know, I, like I, I did text you and say, like, I just broke down uh, and ordered a pizza for the first time. So we might get interrupted, <laughs> get, get interrupted here. But um, yeah, so and every I was going to say earlier that uh, uh, every uh, we did it today, but every Sunday we've been having with the uh, Illustration Academy and the Visual Arts Passage, a live free demo online. And if you, uh, here, here, I just posted in the chat, the illustration isolation is what they're calling it. And um, there's all, there's a, if you go to the site, there's also a, a link that shows uh, the schedule of who's lined up to do demos. But again, it's all free. And then on Thursday nights, we have open drawing also, which if you register for the free demos, uh, you're registered for the drawing night too. And anybody can show up. And the money we're auctioning off or selling the demos and the money goes to the global giving uh, relief fund for coronavirus. Um, anyway, so that's what I've been up to. And then just working at home, teaching and, and painting. Right. Wonderful. And uh, I've had the opportunity to log on to Visual Arts Passage a few times um, over the years. And it's... It's very intuitive, and that's one thing I wanted to, to talk to you about, is you guys have been kind of really ahead of the curve on this because you've been working virtually with people for several years now. Um, I've talked to a collaborator, and a, also, she's also a high school art teacher earlier. I know her, along with several other teachers I know, are really kind of struggling to catch up here on this one. Yeah, yeah, we, you know, with the, well, the, uh, you know, every summer I teach with the Illustration Academy. And we canceled it this year because of this. And, um, but online teaching with the, uh, I've been a guest speaker many times on the, and have taught a couple of classes during the summer with the Visual Arts uh, Passage program, which is a non-accredited art program that's, that's pretty fantastic. And, and so we've been using Zoom there. And so I was already up to speed on that when all this hit and had even like a lot of things prepared that I could just plug into my, my own classes and run with it. But yeah, it's, um, it's sort of a wake up call for a lot of people uh, to get on board with uh, the online. And really these days, you know, schools, if they really want to keep up, they do need to, to have a really robust online presence because it's, it's just what's going on, you know. Uh, definitely, I think it will help the, uh the cur the comfort curve, you know, we're on the other side of this, people are definitely gonna be a little more open and com comfortable interacting and learning that way. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for myself, you know, but it's even still thrown my schedule off pretty good bit just from, I get, you know, probably just worry and everything else. Cause I, you know, I had intended to go to Texas during spring break to visit my mother and She's 84 and I uh, had a cold and I went to the doctor and got checked out and they were like, yeah, this is not that. But, you know, the idea of getting on an airplane with people who might be infected, I was like, yeah, there's no way that that's going to happen to put my mom in danger like that. So, <clears throat> you know, but it's but it still did sort of rattle the cage a little bit and my sleeping habits 
never great to begin with, but have, they're in a weird cycle now, you know, but, um, still getting some work done. Um, painting, drawing, uh, did my demo a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. Um, and incidentally, like, uh, John Foster, you know, teaches full time now at Ringling College of Art and Design, where I teach as well. <clears throat> and, uh, we trust each other. Like we're not, neither one of us have been going out to anything. So he comes over and we like binge on Ozark and stuff like that, you know, and then try to get some painting yeah. done here. And then he heads back home. And, uh, so there's a little bit of social contact, you know, which is all right. Um, uh, but otherwise, yeah, just staying home. I've been working on, uh, some books, uh, with Kasra Ganbari, uh, who has done, uh, if you remember the tome, uh, Kickstarters a while back. This is Kazra. And we're going to do a whole series of books of my work. Um, but the first one that we're working on is uh, try a collection of all my, hopefully as much as possible, of all my short sequential work into one volume with a bunch of unpublished shorts that I've done that were originally done for the solo series for DC. But they pulled the plug on that. So mine never got published and I own all that work. So that'll be the first time that stuff has been published and or really seen. Um, Can you so say been, what character that is? No, it's, uh, well, one of the characters was uh, Sergeant Rock, but now it can't be oh. Sergeant Rock. <laughs> oh. So it'll be, it's not gonna, he's just not gonna have a name. Um, and, uh, and then I did a Civil War story and some personal stuff. And I was gonna do one of her, one of the battle albums, you know, uh, which oh, I was yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, I was psyched to get to use that logo and everything, but so now I can't, but, and it'll still be the same idea, you know, just a, a historical aside and, and talk about, you know, synchronicity. It was about the Spanish flu epidemic. So I have, so that's going to be in the book. <clears throat> um, yeah. And I can, you know, if you want at some point, I can, uh, I can show you bits and pieces of that where it, it's in the design stage right now. So it's not really, uh, fully designed or anything, but you can see some of the art from that, which is kind of fun. Um, and I'm lettering certain parts of them now and uh, and still working on some of the stories to finish them up. Uh, there's like an African folk tale, uh, uh, you know, Civil War story, one about when my father was ill, uh, just a whole mishmash, you know, all my old heavy metal work. Um, and I'm hoping to, oh, let me get, there's the pizza, I'll be right back. Pizza. And that's my dog. All right, I've got George muted for a minute. I will flip to this a little bit. I've opened here a little. I'm going to show a sketch that George did in here. Well, I'll just show off some of the pages. back yeah sorry about that <clears throat> i'm glad you muted that i had this open really quick i was going to show um 
original that you oh. you did years back in Kansas City. So are you in Kansas City? Uh, no, currently I'm in North Dakota. Oh, wow. Harvey Dunn uh, territory. I was going to be at a Spectrum or Project Comic Con a few weeks back. Um, again, because I always love that Spectrum show. It's just wonderful. Yeah, it's so. really fun. Cool. Yeah, you know, I, uh, did you did you watch the uh, Spectrum Awards? I did for a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was a lot fun. of fun. They, they, did, they did a really good job. Yeah, of, it was pretty cool. Met together. <laughs> um, I'm going to pull, pull that camera out. Yeah. Um, I can share some of you. Some of the work I have pulled up. Okay. Here. I just I just kind of grabbed some some things. Um, this book is still available on your website, correct? That's right, along with the uh, sketchbook as well. And those were kind of dipping my toes into the self-publishing world uh, with the idea of doing you know just to see how they would do, and then in preparation for for larger volumes, like I mentioned with uh, Kasra Ganbari, that we're going to do. You know, the first one is the comics, <clears throat> and then we're going to do one on drawing and one on watercolor, one on oils, uh, and hopefully, too, possibly uh, kind of finally get into print some of the project, like the Blues book and the Holocaust book and stuff like that, that have just been sitting around forever, you know, looking for publishers, you know, um, the Wolverine series. Yeah, that was fun. And then yeah, like gallery work, more personal pieces uh, done for my for myself. And then I took a sabbatical. Oh, that's an oldie. Um, took a sabbatical, uh, my first one ever, and I went to um, Morocco for two months, and uh, and just wandered and sketched and photographed and <clears throat> ended up living with a with a uh, Berber family in Fez in the old city. Uh, John Foster was there for the first three weeks, um, and then he headed back, and I, I, I kept going. Uh, but it was an amazing trip, and uh, I'm trying to talk John into putting together a book of our sketchbooks and some of the paintings we've done since we got back from that that trip, you know, gallery work. So we'll see. Yeah, I followed, followed along on your Instagram as you, were, as you were doing it, and it was just so cool and such beautiful shots, you know, like. It was amazing. Um, the people were so nice and yeah, everywhere you looked, it was just, you know, amazing imagery all over the place. I'd wanted to go to that, uh, to Morocco for since art school, really, uh, because of John uh, Singer Sargent's watercolors specifically and Brangwen and I uh, can't believe I can't think of his name, Arthur Melville's watercolors and stuff like that, Delacroix, you know. So I waited a long time would say to anybody that has an idea, you know, a, a passion to go somewhere like that, just go, don't wait. <laughs> you know, I waited way too long, but it was yeah. an amazing trip. <clears throat> Worth going. I'll kind of parlay off of that. One thing I talked to uh, Greg Ruth and, and Dwight yesterday about, um, it's always been kind of like my view and that they agreed with me to, to some extent that um, you and John Foster um, and Chiarello and Kent Williams were kind of like the Studio 2.0 um, <laughs> to Jamie, a lot of us. Yeah, Scott yeah. Hanna, uh, Scott Hampton, and yeah, well, you know, it was really wild, like, and John Van Fleet, and we went to a Kent, John, uh, it was Kent, John Van Fleet, Peter Cooper, uh, Dan Klaus, Mark Chirello, Scott Hanna, um, we were all, and Mark Chirello, we were all at Pratt together in the 80s, early 80s, and uh, comics were not an acceptable thing at the school at all, but we all wanted to do it so badly, we just kind of kept going, you know, and, um, and then we met uh, Jeff Jones, uh, Kent and I did, uh, along with Ed, Ed Lee, who's a, a really great artist, <clears throat> we met Jeff at, uh, New York con and then he invited us up and that's how we met Jay Muth 
um, and uh, and just you know started doing more comic. We all wanted to be comic guys originally. And Jeff's work was sort of the catalyst to make at least myself and, and Ken, I know, to, to be painters. Um, and one of the first artists I called when I got to New York was Mike Kaluta. And uh, he was like amazing, you know, just for, it was my freshman year. And he was so nice. I was like, yeah, come on over, you know, and showed him my stuff. And I got there at eight in the morning and I left at eight o'clock that night. <laughs> we, like it was amazing. Like, he knew how important it was. And it was just an amazing time. And Charles Vest was sharing the studio with him, the apartment. So I got to meet Charles. Um, and then on other visits, you know, Stephen Hickman would come over and all in and Dave Stevens and uh, Jeff Smith and whatever. And it was just like, you know, uh, it was just a great, great time to, to be wanting to break in. And, you know, and it was everybody was, and I think people still are really incredibly accepting and, 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 uh, you know, wanting you to, they're just excited. Anyone wants to do it at all, you know? Uh, and I also apprenticed with Marshall Rogers as a freshman then. And, and uh, that kind of cured me of wanting to do just regular comics consistently. Cause one, I didn't have the speed. I knew, I, I knew I couldn't do a, a regular book, you know, I still couldn't do a regular book. Um, but it, but it, you know, watching uh, Marshall work and help, I was like, I was the guy that put, would put all the zip tone down and, draw the chain link fences and all this kind of stuff, the grunt labor aspects of some of those, those things. And, um, and it was up at continuity studios and it was great to see it, you know, and to and experience it, but it definitely cured me of wanting to just do comics, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, gr <laughs> the grind of it. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, it hats off every, every, everybody that does them deserves a medal because it's, extremely difficult work and it's hard work uh it's it's a lot of work for for not a lot of pay you do it because you absolutely love it you know and i do i love comics i just don't want to have to depend on them for my livelihood uh but man i just have so much respect for anyone that can do that does it period but who does regular books that's mind-blowing to me you know uh it's just amazing and, you know, and I, I have classes and I teach, a, well, I haven't taught it in, a, in a, a year or two, but I have a, I started a graphic novel course at, well, I started one at Pratt when I taught there, but then at Ringling and the students are all excited and then they get in there and they start doing it and they're like, oh my God, it's so much work. And it's like, <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. You know, you gotta love it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's something Greg and I talked about last night was, you know, the, for me as a guy it's kind of in the trenches it's always exciting to see somebody that is absolutely doing it because they love it you know yeah. like like you and, and greg people that are really high level illustrators on their own you know and really the only reason you have to do comics is just because you love the medium of telling stories in that way yeah and, and it shows and that's that's a lot of what i'm trying to share with other people through this um through this weekend so yeah well you know and it's one of those things it's um it was in my this my speech for the spectrum awards for the comics category this uh last weekend whatever was you know when you're when you're doing comics and yes you have a writer who you know obviously contributes as much in in many ways right uh the storyline a whole bit but there's it's such a uh you know, a back and forth between the two, but the artist has to basically wear so many hats, uh, put on so many coats. I mean, you're like an art director, you're a cinematographer, stuntman, uh, lighting technician, uh, actor, you know, uh, special effects guy. I mean, it's just, you have to do all of these things and, and, for anywhere from one to how many panels on a page for how many pages. And it's, it's, uh, it's a massive amount of work and it, and it really does. I don't know how people do it all the time because uh, it, it, it drains the hell out of me. You know um, I, I think it's the most difficult art form there is. I, I, I shared a cab years ago with uh, Klaus Jansen. We were, we were leaving DC and, 
we were both heading towards the village and I was like, you want to share a cab? He's like, yeah. And we got in the cab and we were just talking and we both were agreeing about that. Like, this is the most difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, I can do gallery work. I can paint, I can draw, I can, you know, uh, all kinds of different venues for where to plug our work into, but comics demands so much work, you know, um, that it's, it's mind blowing, you know, so. So I think you see a, a you know, a great proliferation of, um, you know, cover artists and pinup artists and, you know, it's seeming more and more that the guys that get in and, and you know, even do six issues is, is becoming fewer and far between. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, hats it, off, uh, it's off, hats off to those that do. And especially, like I said, you know, guys like you that, um, you know, go out and still do that other work, but still dip your, your toe back in the, the storytelling waters. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, and I definitely consider myself an outlier, you know, because I don't do it all the time. And it's why I have so much respect for those that do. But um, I love, it is about the stories. I love the stories, but I also think that <clears throat> that, that marriage between words and pictures is so incredible. And so unlike any other, and yes, there are children's books that have, you know, words and pictures, but it's a different animal, totally. And, um, and I think it's just um, so special, you know, by itself. And, you know, it, get, it gets compared to movies and it's like, oh, movies on paper. And it's like, yeah, not really. You know, I mean, yes, there's cinematic uh, elements to, to that in a big way. And there are certain obvious limitations that we have as comic artists. But we also have so much more freedom in uh, in format than movies do, you know. Right. And you see cinematographers really struggling with that that you know, aspect ratio and how do I slice this thing up to make it interesting and and so that it's not just this, you know, <clears throat> which right. is always you know uh, was my struggle with because I love comic strip art also, but I don't know how those people do it and be bound by that that limited space, you know, consistently. That's, that's amazing to me. I couldn't do that. You know, uh, I want to like break out and do long, tall panels and wide panels and squares and this and that, you know? Um, so that's, but it's all, but again, it's all just amazing, you know, and wonderful. What's the beauty of it too. I think, you know, a hundred people in a room watching a movie are all going to watch the same movie but a hundred people in a room reading the same comic are all going to read a different comic because, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then story-wise, you know, that is something we have in common I, that, you know, uh, I think even in movies, people are going to take away what they take away. Um, but I, I keep telling my students, you know, like when you watch a movie, um, it's, I mean, the best movies challenge you, you know, they do. Um, but, on the whole, you know, the games and the movies, even though you're solving puzzles in the games, it's it's basically, uh, it's, as far as the information coming in, it's, there's a very passive, uh, it's, a, it's sort of passive entertainment. You're just being fed and uh, except for the best stuff, which challenges you and, at, and forces you to ask questions and stuff like that. And comics do the same thing, but I think comic, because you have to, read and and because the you know what goes on between panels in the middle <clears throat> the reader has to fill that gap and yeah and uh and it is you know different in some ways than uh than any other form of entertainment in that way you know um, well, just... yeah go ahead Mo. i'm good <laughs> <laughs> i'll say i'll use that to uh, jump over to, to filmmaking. Um, you made a, a documentary film called See You in Hell, Blind Boy. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been the early 90s you were working on that? Well, <clears throat> actually, we uh, when I was working on Enemy Ace, um, I went to uh, Tower Records when it was still vinyl. <laughs> they had just started putting out DV, uh, CDs. And I had just bought like a disc man. And, uh, but I would always consistently go up to the folk section. You know, I was real into John Renborn and uh, 
Pierre Ben Susan and these guitar, you know, players. <clears throat> and <clears throat> they had this music on there that I'd never heard and it was blowing my mind and it was Mississippi John Hurt. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, you know, and I bought that one disc and I played that thing into the ground, you know, and I was like, oh man, I have to, I've got to do something with this. And I, and I grew up in Texas and my mother was from Mississippi. So, and from the same town as Robert Johnson and Johnny Winter and Edgar Winter from my, were from my hometown. And uh, so I was like, man, I really want to do something with this and started uh, writing uh, an, an idea down in uh, a novel basically that was going to have comics in it. And, uh, and I had a relationship with this girl and the whole thing went sour and I went home and uh, I had the blues for real you know, and uh, took a trip uh, just on a, on a whim, rented a car and took a trip, drove into Mississippi, stayed at my grandmother's. Uh, she was still alive then and just went and started knocking on doors and talking to people and asking about the blues <clears throat> and uh, ended up meeting so many amazing people. And I recorded everything and I took tons of 35 millimeters before digital. And, uh, and that became sort of the genesis of this whole project, you know, the, the putting the two together. So it's, it's very much uh, like a real slice of my life, you know, for factual real stuff. And then there's also fiction involved that I sort of muddy the waters with that. And um, I was called by Stephen Budlong, who was at that time vice president in charge of television services for Citicorp. And he was, but he was a big comic book fan. And he wanted to do a documentary on Enemy Ace and how I handled history in that, uh, in that book. But I was so burned out on the war stuff. And I said, well, I'm doing another book uh, that is also about the history of the blues. It's about the history of the blues. And you could follow that from early beginnings, you know? And he was like, oh man, that's great. So <clears throat> we took a trip and re we redid my trip through the Mississippi Delta and interviewed all these, these guys that I met, plus some extra people that I hadn't met originally. And uh, so that was in the late, you know, late eighties, really like 87, 88. Um, and then, uh, it really took us about literally five years to edit that film because we were doing it late at night, uh, after we had all, uh, we had already done all our daily work and it was, and it was like, you know, it wasn't consistent. We weren't editing every day. It was just, yeah. catch as catch can. Uh, so it took five years to edit the film and then, uh, we released it at the New York International Independent Film Festival. Uh, I forget what year that was, honestly, but, um, and we had Johnny Winter came to the opening and, and that was a synchronicity thing too, because I had been called by uh, D'Addario Guitar Strings, the art director there. And he wanted me, he was doing a calendar uh, and he, Bill Sienkiewicz did a piece for them. Uh, but we, we were each asked to do an artist and uh, a blues artist or a guitar, you know, music, musical uh a musician and they had asked me to do Johnny Winter and I was like oh, perfect you know and uh, so I did the I, I my sketches had to go through Johnny's uh, agent who didn't like my sketches at all <laughs> and uh, but I had gone to I forget I had gone home to visit my my mom my family and uh a, a friend of the family was over and I was showing her the blues stuff. She goes, Oh man, you know, you really should talk to Johnny winter. And I was like, yeah, that, I would love that. <laughs> you know, she goes, Oh, hang on. And she got on her phone and called Johnny's mother. And she's like, I have someone here. Your son needs to talk to and whatever. And she goes, okay. So she took my number and I remember getting home to Brooklyn and my answering machine was beeping and it was, he goes, hi, this is Johnny Winter. Uh, Mom says I'm supposed to call you, you know, for some reason. <laughs> so, so I got to talk to Johnny Winter and I said, hey, you know, uh, I'm doing this thing for D'Addario and, but your agent shot down all my sketches. And I was like, 
do you mind? Could I come over and actually show you my sketches and talk to you about this book I'm working on? He goes, yeah, okay, yeah. So he was in Manhattan. So I went there and showed him my sketches. And, uh, and, he's, and I said, you know, he picked one that he liked. And I said, he goes, well, and I said, okay, well, I'll do, I'll paint that. He goes, well, what if I don't like the painting? I said, well, then I'll do you another one. Nope, no big deal. And he goes, okay, cool. And I had had this, uh, I, when we were filming, I had gone, well, and I still went down to Mississippi uh, a few times after my original trip. And uh, specifically during my grandmother's funeral, I went and saw one of the guys that I had interviewed, which was Jack Owens, who was uh, at that time, like 93 years old. And, uh, and he was one of the original blues guys in the twenties who had recorded, you know, and, uh, but then vanished because he went back to just tend his field, his cotton fields. Yeah. And, uh, and I had played him some Johnny Winter and he was like, oh, he goes, man, he's like a, he's a note guy like me, you know? Uh, and he was really into the music and I had recorded that. And I, and I went and I had recordings of Jack. And I, when I was at Johnny's, I was like, you got to hear this guy. I said, he was from Bentonia and he was the cousin of Skip James. And, and he said, oh, well, yeah, let me, okay. You know, so I plugged it in. I let him hear it. And he goes, he can, well, before that, he says, yeah, he goes, you know, everybody's always saying that it's in the mud in Bentonia, you know, and he goes, but, you know, he goes, I don't really believe that. He goes, cause Skip James was just a genius, you know? And so I play this thing and Johnny Winter's like, oh my God, I got to go to Bentonia and roll around in the mud for a while, <laughs> you know? And uh, so I did the painting and uh, he, and he said, and I said, well, you know, how do I show you the painting? He goes, well, he goes, I'm, I'm in rehearsals. Come, come over to the Sony recording studios. And I was like, cool. So I took the painting there and it was just him and his band, two guys, a drummer and a, and a bassist and his agent and uh, I showed them the painting and they were like they loved it which was great I was worried you know and it was a big piece it was you know 30 something square or something like that and uh and I was like do you mind if I just hang out you know <laughs> and he goes no that's why I had you come in so man I literally got a five-hour concert of Johnny Winter just jamming with his band telling stories and all it was amazing you know um, and a funny story about that painting was it got into the Society of Illustrators that year and uh, D'Addario had bought the painting for their collection and I went to pick my painting up after the show and I and it was in a box and I got on the subway train rush hour and you know waited forever got on the train and this is way up in the 60s or no 90s uh, where uh, Society of Illustrators is. And I remember getting on, I was waiting forever. And I remember the train showed up and I was like, so thrilled just to be able to get on the train. And I was like four stops down when I realized, oh my God, I'd left the painting on the, on the platform. I was like, oh my, like, and <laughs> there was no way I could pay back that money they paid. And I was like freaking out. And I got on the next train back and I'm, I'm just sweating bullets because I know that thing has just walked away, you know? Yeah. But I got there and there were all these, this group of little old ladies with their shopping cart things and they're like opening the box up and I ran up and I'm like oh my god and they're like oh is this yours and I'm like yes <laughs> so major bailout you know I, I was able to get home and, and send it immediately to get it out of my own you know hand so I didn't uh, lose it again so that's some scary. luck for sure <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's but, awesome uh, oh well that you know in the, the film uh, so Johnny came to our opening for the for the premiere which was really cool this big stretch limo pulled up and johnny winter got out and it's funny uh well steven we he and i have were working on before i left new york in 98 he and i had started working on another documentary which was on harvey dunn north dakota action there uh he's from around he's from that area they got if you've ever seen a street named after harvey dunn that's who it is he's a great painter was one of the howard Pyle students mm -hmm. And um, so we were, Steve said, oh, you know, I really want to do another, another film with you. And I, he goes, do you have any ideas? And I was like, yeah, uh, a documentary on Harvey Dunn, who's one of my heroes, you know, and specifically the work he did in World War I. And they sent eight artists to the front during the First World War. 
six of them were Howard Pyle students. And uh, so we started filming this. And we, and when we interviewed uh, some of the surviving children of the other uh, uh, combat artists who went there, we interviewed Walt Reed at the illustration house. Uh, and, and he was pals with um, the Dunn family and with uh, Richard Kelly from the Kelly collection. Uh, have you ever heard of the Kelly girl uh, temp agency? That's, that's them. And he has one of the largest collections of Harvey Dunn paintings, especially in golden age. That's all he collects. So they overnighted two Harvey Dunn oils for us to put up behind Walt and the family sent some of Harvey Dunn's actual sketchbooks that we could look through and film. And then we went to the Smithsonian and they took us into the belly of the beast and like pulled everything out of the drawers for us to film of Harvey Dunn, even his oh, wow. box that he carried into combat, you know, to, to draw. Um, and so we've been working on this and then I left and then Steve left uh, uh, Citibank and, and we just weren't able to continue to pursue it. Although I did, I did, I got to direct a segment at the uh, D South Dakota Museum of, of Fine Art and um, of, a, of all, they had a big show of a lot of the Harvey Dunn war art. Um, and, and there too, we interviewed, uh, I interviewed two uh, Vietnam combat vets, uh, combat artists, um, and that was really cool. And then the guy who wrote the original Harvey Dunn book, but then it just sort of lapsed into, you know, I wasn't there, so I couldn't really contribute. And Steve had all kinds of other stuff going on. And, uh, but, and so we, then uh, like less, I guess about a year ago, Steve called and was like, Hey, I really want to, let's, let's make this happen. Let's do it. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. And, and we started ramping up trying to get funding and whatever. And then Steve passed away and uh, his children have the material, which is great. Uh, and I'm on good terms with them. So we, maybe that will, uh, you know, finally come to fruition, but our blues film, we won best feature documentary at that opening, which was really cool. Cause there were like, I mean, there were films from all over the world in competition for that. So that was real, uh, gratifying to have that happen. And, uh, uh, and to have Johnny Winter there for it. And then we did the, the festival circuit, you know, Santa Barbara and uh, Hot Springs and stuff like that. So it was, it was a real learning experience for me because I originally had wanted to also be a filmmaker and had done a lot of Super 8 films as a kid. Uh, and I, when I was deciding whether to go to, you know, to go to art school, because uh, I went to a university first for a year and just did liberal arts stuff, you know, uh, and I, my father, and I was very fortunate, my father, you know, paid for me to go to college. Um, and he said, look, I, you know, you can go to film school or you can go to art school and you can take your pick, but this is it right now. You got to make your choice or you stay where you are in the university. And he goes, but that's your, you know, what, that's your choice, you know? And I, man, I joined the fraternity and I had a girlfriend and I was, I was set, you know? And he said, but you know, this is something you've always wanted and here it is, but you need to make up your mind what you're going to do. And I was like, yeah, you know, so I, I went to art school. Um, if only I'd gone to film school, maybe I could have lots of money in it. <laughs> you know? But, uh, and art school was great. It was like, I was in heaven because I was finally surrounded by all these weirdos, just like me, you know, <laughs> it's like, you put us all in one place, you know? And, uh, and I wasn't getting grief for being a daydreamer and, you know, what, what not, you know, uh, it was yeah, like yeah. changed my life, you know, it was great. And I chose New York uh, and I chose Pratt in, uh, not because I'm family, cause I'm not, I'm not related in any way, shape or form to the school, but not that my teachers knew that. Right. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was cause Pratt Institute had a really nice campus and it was in New York city, uh, which were, where the comic book companies were at that time. I was like, yeah, man, I want to be, I want to be in the, you know, the nucleus of the, uh, of that, the center of that publishing industry. Right. Then, cause that's what I want to do. So, and it was the, it was the publishing empire of the world at the time, you know, I mean, all the publishers were there of yeah. everything, you know, really. So yeah, it was a great choice, great decision. And that's where I met, honestly, uh, 
I have several friends from high school that I'm and all, you know, in, in elementary school. Uh, but really my uh, the friends that I've stayed most in contact with, aside from a couple, uh, I met in art school, you know. Dan Klaus was my roommate uh, for one, one semester, <laughs> you know. He was a year ahead of me, but um, yeah, so it was great. That's awesome, and it's, uh, you know, obviously what you got from that and what you've done with your career now as an educator, you've, um, you know, you're helped facilitating that for dozens, if not hundreds of, of people, you know, over, over the years, so. Um, well, that's a, that's a big, big thing for me because um, Baron's, I had Baron Story as a instructor my sophomore year, and and there were a lot of good teachers at Pratt, Dave Pasolacqua, Jerry Contreras, Don Albright, uh, Mr. Fogler, who was my form and space teacher. Uh, and I know I'm like, I, I'm trying to remember my uh, light color and design teacher who was unbelievable. And I can't believe I can't think of his name right now, but I had a lot of really good teachers, but Baron was the one who, like uh, one, he did demos, which no one did. Most teachers would not draw in front of you and they would not show you their work. And we already knew Barron's work because we were going through those Society of Illustrators books. And I was a you know avid uh, reader and collector of books. So I would see Barron's story. I would buy books just for their covers, you know, for the Barron story and Jeff Jones covers and Frazetta, mm -hmm. you know, and whoever. Um, so we knew Barron's work and we were like, oh my God, you know, I really want to study under this guy. And, and he did Time Magazine covers. He worked for, you know, National Geographic, I mean, you name it. And uh, he was the only one who did demos. And he, he, you know, I can't say I didn't have, I had a ton of teachers who were totally against comics, but Baron totally got it, you know, he totally understood it. And uh, he also, I, he got a handout from Baron. It was one of the only actual handouts that we got in my entire four years. And it was his handwritten, uh, you know, Xerox, but handwritten treatise on illustration and art. You know, it was amazing, doc, amazing little book, a uh, uh, sheet of uh, sheaf of pages that I still give to all my students. And uh, it changed the way, I mean, it totally informed the way I teach. And then, you know, talking with Kaluta and Jeff Jones and, and Barry Windsor Smith and Wrightson. And I mean, everybody that we hit on to like, help to like one be fawning fawning fanboys and then two to ask to pick their brains you know they were all like so open and so helpful and 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 whenever i would bring up like yeah but you know i don't man i don't know how i can repay you for this and they're always like pay it forward pay it forward every one of them you know um and that so that's that's totally informed why i love teaching because it helped me so much to have people that were really engaged and cared about what happened to you, you know what I mean? And, and what information you were actually getting uh, changed my life, you know, for the better in, in so many ways. And so, um, yeah. And that's why also, you know, I teach at the illustration Academy is everybody there one almost uh, you know, most of those teachers that I'm working with are heroes of mine <clears throat> and to find out that they are, really in it for the students and that they they themselves still consider themselves students they're that engaged and that hungry for more info you know and discovery and all that is just amazing you know and worth its weight in gold and i would have killed for something like that when i was in school um you can't. I got accepted last year. I really wanted to go, but I wasn't able to quite work it out. But. Oh yeah, uh, man, you'll uh, it, it'll literally it'll change your mind because uh, change your change your life because uh, it's not only just you know you go to this thing, but it's it's a it's a serious community uh, of people that through throughout the history of that program that you are then connected to and have access to, along with the professionals right. that you're being taught by. You know, so it's like you know, being able to, to pick Gary Kelly's brain and Chris Payne and, you know, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz is now teaching with us every year, which is, which is great. And Vanessa Del Rey, who was 
one of my teachers, uh, one of my students at Ringling and then took the academy also. Uh, Natalie Hall, you know, I mean, Sterling was all, Sterling Hundley was a student of the academy and then later taught. And it's just an amazing program. And it was begun by Mark English. It was originally called the Illustrator's Workshop, which was Mark English. So get this line up, right? Mark English, uh, Bob Peake, Ernie Fuchs, Alan Kober, and Fred Opnes, and Robert Heindel. <laughs> you know, the, yeah. these are the gods of illustration, you know. Um, I listened then, to uh, John English talk to Brett Watkinson about that on, a, on the podcast. It was, just, yeah. it was cool to hear the story of how it really all kind of came together back in the day. Yeah, and then, you know, you can thank Sterling for it's actually still being a one well, obviously John English but you can thank Sterling for convincing John to keep doing it because at that point when Sterling took it uh John was about ready to give it up because it you know I, I don't remember why but it had sort of I mean it's a lot of work to get that thing set up and and Sterling was like John you you cannot you have to keep this thing going because it's like there's nothing else on the planet like it and it 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 it, it, it really changes people's lives for the better. Um, and so, yeah, it's still going strong, you know. Um, and that's I know what, John struggled so hard with uh, canceling it this year. He re I mean, he really, you know, his father passed away um, not too long ago. And John, this was, this was going to be the first year without Mark there. And it was going to be a difficult year anyway because of that. It was going to be fairly heavy. But John, it really broke his heart to, to have to cancel it, especially now because of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so he has begun this thing, which is, excuse me, uh, you know, that we're doing on Sundays and on Thursdays as a way to, you know, honor that, that commitment to teaching and helping other people and, uh, but doing it for free, you know, so people can get something in, the, in this time where we're just sort of stuck at home and people are getting, you know, cabin fever and getting cagey uh, ways right. to open it up and, and have some some interaction with people who are in the same boat and who want to still progress in their learning and, and in their uh, in their skills, you know. I shared that link on Facebook and I'll put a link to that also in the description of the video when it goes oh, to that's the archives too. Thank so, you. That'd be great. Um, and it's out. fun, you know, when we're doing those things, other artists are popping in, you know, uh, to, to help out and play right. play wingman and co-pilot and field the chat while they're doing their demos. And it's really fun, you know, and we've had a great turnout for the live drawing stuff. Um, and people then there's a, a Facebook page dedicated to the live drawing uh, thing that we do that everybody can post their work. And it's really fun to see how that when we have a live model and Timmy, who's John's uh, business partner, uh, is a professional photographer among many other things. And he like sets up, you can see the studio and he's, and whoever's uh, board is, is pinned like this, um, who's on, on point gets to pose the model. And then Timmy takes a picture of that setup and it's posted on a, a Google drive and everybody can download it and then work from the same image. And then we look at oh, nice. how everybody approached it. It's really fun. Uh, I, I will. Uh, I'll try and get in on that tomorrow, but um, depending on how the the schedule is working. Yeah, for that'd me, be great. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been absolutely been picking up on various different groups and and uh, um, yeah. You know, there's the several several different uh, comic hosts and like essential sequentials having live drawing with artists and oh great. Um, uh, Sean Crystal for Ink Pop Audio has been doing stuff, and that's um, cool. So it's it, it's been cool to just see everybody kind of check in with each other and, and do some art together. And um, you know, one thing I kind of talked about was the like how the Black Plague beget the Awakening, beget the Renaissance, and you know, see everybody turn towards art right now and and. Yeah. put their heart into it even if they were just passive hobbyists at best they're starting to think about how they can actually use that as a type of currency you know in their lives and and with their friends and yeah. i think there's really something special and magical happening right now artistically and musically and yeah i have uh in my classes i've uh i also have a 
at Ringling, I have a six hour uh, sketchbook class that I teach with the students. And, but I've, I've actually given this to all my students, all my classes is that, because they have to keep a sketchbook for my class anyway. And I said, okay, but let's, let's turn this to what's happening, you know, and, and uh, cause this is a historical moment that we're in and, you know, people's thoughts and uh, ideas and, you know, fears. Uh, and I said to him, I was like, you know, let this be a, a sketchbook journal. And I said, and, you know, and I gave them a whole list of prompts, you know, like what, how do you feel about this? You know, uh, is it, do you know anyone that's affected by this? And what are you turning to for solace? You know, uh, are there, are there, uh, is it people and or music, art, you know, and uh, what gives you comfort? What, what helps with your emotional stability right now? You know, what, you know, f what's your happy place, you know? And, uh, and like really put this stuff down because it's one, it's good for us just to do it, right? It gives you purpose. But it, I think they're going to be valuable documents in the future for people to, to see what was really going on and what the mindset is of all these creative people, you know. Um, so we'll see. And I've got to tell them it was like quarantine journal, you know, so we'll see what yeah. happens. So. Yeah, I have several friends that are doing, you know, plague journals of various sorts. Um, yeah. You know, I've been doing a lot of... Uh, guitar daily kind of guitar updates and stuff and nice um uh, and if you uh, could send it, me if you could send me links to some of the uh things you're attending and and some of these people i would love to, to scope it out sure absolutely yeah cool um you know, you start to realize that uh, the world's a lot smaller than it than it has to be sometimes so this has been a real treat yeah oh it's it, it is it's awesome you know and i've actually uh not this specifically, but uh, what we've been doing on Sundays and whatever. I didn't have time to get it, get this to my uh, my mom and my sister who are quarantined together. But uh, a lot of my family has been checking out some of these things, and they're like, it's just they're blown away by the outpouring and the you know the, yeah. the giving that people are doing, and it's and it's sort of like it's neat, get it's sort of a glimpse into our world, you know, that we that we know that they don't know. Yeah. And it's pretty cool, and it's opening them up to a whole whole other set of uh, you know uh, worlds and things. You know, great Poss possibilities. Um, George, I know you're there waiting for you. You've, you've been more than generous with your time. Um, is there anything else you'd like to to plug or say before we go? I mean, it's up to you. I could like show you a few images if you want, or uh, I would. Uh, yeah, I would love to uh, see anything you would like to share. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Do I need to? I need to share my desktop. So let me do that. Now, I, and I kind of queued some things up. Let's see. What do I have? Um, oh, that I just zoomed on by it. There it is. So there was this thing in uh, Draw Magazine not too long ago with uh, the cover is uh, Donato Giancola. Um, and it's, they had an article on uh, that Mike Manley and I did together. Uh, he interviewed me through email or actually on the phone and, uh, and then sent it to me and I, and I kind of plugged in a bunch of art. So uh, you could go and it, it is such a great magazine, you know, because it's always full of really interesting articles on, on how to's and, and uh, articles about the state of the industry and, and how to, uh, and like technical stuff about comics, which is really cool and just drawing. Um, and so I put in a bunch of uh, step by steps that I'd photographed. And there's that cover of that book that you had shown, um, which actually there was, I was really uh, thrilled that piece, which is of my daughter <clears throat> is uh was accepted into the uh, International uh, Portrait Society competition that year. I was one of the 20 finalists and uh, didn't win, but I was like so thrilled to actually just be included, you know, and to be a finalist and get to meet a lot of these portrait painters who are just amazing. You know, that was, that was one, it was in Washington, DC is where they held it. And so I, I put in a lot of stuff, there's enemy ace and a lot of stuff from, uh, you know, uh, my career, basically. That's the whole painting of the, that they only used a slice of that for the uh, Warner Brothers uh, 
Warner Books edition of Enemy Ace, this piece here. Uh, but it's a six foot oil uh, on six by four on canvas. Uh, and this gives the whole process of a Batman cover, you know, the old school, because uh, this is the old way we would do the color notes, you know, you'd have to watercolor it and then take the, the chart they gave you and actually specify what those colors were by the code of how they mix those colors. Total old school stuff. But, yeah, yeah. And you can see it's, it, you know, like the closest I could come to that color was sort of this, you know, <laughs> you know. But I, but I love the way the way it turned out. Um, and then a watercolor, you know, straight up, which I don't do any penciling. I just start painting, you know, and and pull pull it through. Um, there's one of the blue sketches on my trip. Uh, these were the Batman layouts for Harvest Breed, so that's an eight and a half by eleven sheet. And I did it small like that, so I couldn't draw, I couldn't noodle, I kept it simple. Of course, you just kind of focus on the shape and the flow. Absolutely, yeah. Same here with Wolverine. I did them larger, it's a page on a page, but kept it, I drew with crayons, uh, the Caran d'Ache uh, Neo colors, but it wouldn't let me noodle that way, you know, change the, the material I'm using. And that's a watercolor in progress here. Um, this is one of the images from the Civil War story, which uh, let me shift over. I can show you, uh, let's see, in design. So this is, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, this thing is already like at around 300 pages. <laughs> it's gonna be a big, big fat book. So you, this, you'll get a kick out of some of this stuff. Let's see. So there's early days, right? Like I must've been 14, years old or something looking at my Neil Adams you know <laughs> and I have a lot of my early work in here which well this is fun this is uh when I was in art school going out painting with that's Bernie Wrightson Jeff Jones and Dan Green uh going out landscape painting um an early painting from the 80s which got me work at uh Eagle Magazine and then my my uh a letter to this is my letter and these are notes to uh, Bill Sienkiewicz is going to write the introduction to this, which will be really cool. So these are notes to Bill. Uh, my letter to Marie Severin in 1978, when I sent my portfolio in, and then her return letter, which is fun, took her a, almost a year, you know, <laughs> to get back to me. And she sent me this packet with my exec pencils and Carrie Gamble and I mean, just awesome pencil stuff to study. Uh, there's Kerry Gamble, a letter from Kerry when I hit him up. Uh, early comic work. I, this was the fanzine my buddy and I did back in 77, 78. And, and that's how I learned how to draw. I mean, I, you know, no shame, but I, 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 I didn't trace, but I, I was copying my heroes. And that's how I learned how to draw. So, you know, lots of swipes, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you know, so and again, more uh, high school stuff. This is all high school, looking at Neil Adams and Barry Smith. It'll load in a second. There you go. John Byrne. I mean, man, I was all over the map. Paul Neary. Uh, let's see. So then, uh, well, this is our, this is high school uh, strip that never got published. And I did like five versions of this thing until I got to this point where I felt it was like I was actually getting it, you know, being able to use the brush and the pen and in my Leroy lettering machine, you know. Uh, I was just gonna, I was gonna ask if, was there a certain point that you really felt like you leveled up? I mean, obviously this looks, um, you know, a lot more professional than, than the couple of pages before it, but yeah, was there like, was there like a, a moment where you're kind of like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I can do this and I'm getting it. And yeah, well, it technically I got, I think technically I got really good, but I didn't, know how to do my own stuff yet really you know um so it was when in art school is when things started to really click um let me make sure these look more like spreads there you go um so this is art school now um and okay. i was really experimenting with you know trying to do painted comics and i was shooting my own reference and actually making it happen you know um and, but I was the king of the unfinished, you know, <laughs> I would start these things and, 
and they would sort of peter out. And this is like uh, 1983, you know, that this I was doing this. Um, and then we That's really uh, Kent, beautiful though. Thank you. And Kent and I and uh, Kent's wife, uh, well, at that time, girlfriend, uh, Sherilyn Van Valkenburg, John Van Fleet, Steve Craig, um, Ed Lee, Peter Cooper, we, we all, <clears throat> self and John Van Fleet, Mark Torello, <clears throat> we started our, we, we published, did a self-published magazine. The school wouldn't do any of this stuff, but we did a thing called Dark Storm. And we had Boris gave us a piece to use and Charles Bess. And uh, this was two of my pages in the book at the time. Um, and then I was also doing a Ray Bradbury adaptation, which I got actual, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, permission from Ray Bradbury to do it because my one of my illustration teachers, Don Albright, was Bradbury's bibliographer. And he's like, hey, I'm going to go see Ray this weekend. You want me to take anything? And I would give him all my Ray Bradbury books. Get him to sign these things, you know. Oh, wow. So I got them all personalized and everything. And then I said, you know, do you think it, it would be okay if I did an adaptation of one of his stories? And he goes, yeah. He goes, I, he goes, I can't. He goes, oh, I just, you know, why don't you call Ray and ask him? I'm like, <laughs> you know. So he gave me the phone number and I called him and he was like, yeah, that, yeah, I would love to see what you do, you know. And uh, so this, this I started doing. And this is Kent Williams posing. We were, you know, and basically that's how we learned. I mean, we taught each other. We had to figure out how to paint because the school wasn't really teaching us how to paint. So we had, we just went out and did landscapes a lot and taught each other how to paint. Um, that's my layout there on the left. And this is my, uh, my form and space teacher, Mr. Fogler. He was a big, big shot at GM as a industrial designer, but he posed for that character and Kent was posing for this character and this is me. <laughs> and then I took it in while I was working on it and showed it to Archie Goodwin at Epic. And he goes, wow, he goes, I really like the art, but it's just way too many headshots. So it was like a learning moment, <laughs> but it just totally yeah. just took the wind out of my sails and I just quit working on it, you know? Um, so it's going to finally see print in its, in its unfinished state, which will be fun. This is me and Kent. We used to travel to the create all the New York cons and set up. We had a big setup that we put out our paintings and our drawings and all that stuff. There's another strip I was working on uh, that never got finished again. Um, this is a page of sample art that Marshall Rogers had me do for um, uh, Madame Xanadu. And it was going to a bunch of Paris rooftops. And uh, I did it first where I actually plotted all the points of perspective, you know, <laughs> and I showed it to him and he goes, okay, this is nice because you plotted all these points, didn't you? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, okay, now I want you to do it again. I just want you to eyeball the stuff, you know, and he, he had given me a book of photographs of Paris rooftops to put it together with and stuff, do whatever I wanted. And this was like one of the best lessons I ever had on perspective because he was like, look, he goes, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. And perspective is this idea that it's, it is a perfect world, you know, and he goes and but buildings sag, they have gesture and, you know, like people do, you know, and so that was a real eye opener. Uh, this was the, I got to ink this over Marshall's uh, pencils and um, that was in our comic that we did. This is my other page in the comic where you can see I was getting my mooka on, you know, <laughs> but inking it, trying to ink like Barry, Barry Smith from Red Nails. Uh, a fake cover that we did. We were trying, we all, Kent and Ed and I went into DC Comics trying to get work and we saw Dick Giordano and he was like, well, first off, he goes, you shouldn't have all come in together. He goes, because I might like one of y'all stuff and now I'm going to feel bad and I'm going to, you know, so he was like, all right, we're like, all right. And he goes, and he looked at all our stuff and he says, you guys do realize you're not ready for this, right? Like, you know, this isn't a playground. I mean, it was like a, it was a smackdown, you know, but, and we did know, you know, but we were like, we, but we could dare to dream and, but we left there so white, just dejected, you know, like, and it was right before Christmas, we were having to all go away, man, what a bummer. And this was the first thing I had published in heavy metal. I was still, a, I was a student and it was 1982 and uh, workman. And I, uh, at this time I was already going up painting with Jeff. And so, and John Workman was a big Jones fan, like all of us were, the, you know, my buddies and I. 
And so we like connected on that Jones level, you know, and he would always show me the new I made strip when Jeff would send it in. And he kept saying, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to find you something to do. And, but he never, he kept look, and he said, you know what? He goes, just go do something and I'll, and I'll publish it. And I was like, all right. So I did this and, uh, and he published it. There's my roughs. And then he did a June 2050 and had me do it. He wrote it. Kent did the lettering. Well, up the, at least this lettering, this looks like, uh, this was not Kent lettering, but, and it, we had, we worked like uh, EC comics. So John had it already lettered. Uh, I guess John did the lettering, John Workman. He had it already lettered. He had it all laid out and it was, the lettering was already inked and the gutters were already there. And I had to just basically fill the panels. That sucked. <laughs> it's like uh, more of my stuff for heavy metal that I wrote and illustrated. So let me jump ahead. Uh, let me go way forward. So this is, here's some of the unpublished work. Well, no, this is published, but I, what I did was take it in and reformat it. This was in a Sergeant Rock special ages ago. It had the Walt uh, Simonson cover. Um, so I, I, I took my original scans of the pages and reformatted it for this larger, wider format. So it's like a director's cut, you know, <laughs> but, um, and recolored it, re-lettered it. So and this is all my buddies posing. There's Scott Hampton, John Van Fleet, Kent Williams. Um, this is when I was living in, uh, well, I was in Brooklyn still, but I went down to visit North Carolina and, and they posed for everything. Um, let me get to the unpublished stuff here. Let's see. Um, all right, so here, this is from the solo. Well, actually, first I'll show you this. This is from Heavy Metal was my first kind of stab at the blues uh, stuff. It'll load, there you go. Um, but here, this is unpublished from Solo. And this was where I did every drawing, every panel is like six different drawings. So it's a pen and ink drawing. Uh, and then I did overlays where I basically did hand sets, but they were drawings, right? So in black, but then I, colorized them in Photoshop. <clears throat> so yeah, I'll never do that again. <laughs> um, so it's got what, what was your what was your reasoning behind um, doing it well, that way? Mark, uh, Mark Chirello had introduced me. Uh, he had been introduced to uh, Edward Tooney, German illustrator from Simplicissimus back in the 1800s to 1940 something. <clears throat> um, by Alex Toth introduced him to that stuff. And then Mark introduced Tooney's work to me. And I was like, <clears throat> you know, and uh, so I wanted to try and em sort of emulate his method, which was uh, he utilized a lot of splatter and then they would be shot as line art back then in the 1800s. And they would add like a single color, almost like, uh, well, exactly like say, uh, you know, Cages by Dave McKeon and, and uh, books like that, you know, where they right. have the one color in black and white. Uh, but I wanted to take it to a whole different level where it's like, okay, but what if it was full color, you know? Um, and everything was a separate drawing that's laid into this whole, you know, quilt. Okay. Yeah. So that's where it came from. Um, so there's that whole story. And then there's this, which is going to be a, uh, it's a, uh, sort of a history of barbed wire. And that's the name of the book is Devil's Rope and Other Tales. Um, and that, that the text isn't on here yet. And then this is the Sergeant Rock story. That's no longer a Sergeant Rock story. <laughs> I had to go in and I got rid of Little Sure Shot's feather and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and he was only in like a back, he was a figure in the back, but I, I went and took the panel. I think I, I got rid of the feather. And this is Sterling Hundley posing for Sergeant Rock. <laughs> uh, you said it, I can tell. Yeah. A little bit. So that's that. And then Oops. this is the, this was gonna be the battle album, but is now just Spanish influenza in the Great War. Um, uh, this is the story that I'm working on now, finishing up. Is uh, this was an old cover for a for a independent publisher comic book, 
But this is uh, from my sketchbook when my father was ill in 1995. Um, so I, I open it with that and it's called Hugging Rodan. Uh, so this is in progress. Oh, wow. Uh, and then my character Entropy, which was originally published in, in Heavy Metal. Uh, and I'm going to scan the original story. This is one I'm working on, another one, a new one I'm working on. So there'll be the original four pager plus this, which is in progress. About the, Interestingly enough, about the plague. Uh, and some old paintings of the character that I did way back. Teddy Christensen owns this painting. This was the, I won the gold medal that year at Spectrum for this piece. Um, they're, old, they're older paintings when I was still living in, living in New York. This was a backup in uh, Monocyte from IDW. So we're gonna reprint it here. It was a story I dedicated to Jeff after he passed, passed away. And I had my children, they were really little at the time and I had them do drawings of flowers which became the, di what became the, uh, the dialogue. <clears throat> This was published in France, but I, I expanded it. Again, director's cut, you know, re, redesigned it, expanded it for, the, for this format. Uh, the work I did for uh, this book, which is the cover is for uh, Above the Dreamless Dead for first second. Uh, and it's three illustrated uh, adaptations I did of Wilfred Owen poems. And again, I've gone through a couple of these and reformatted them to take better advantage of the scale. And these are old pieces that were like demos at the Academy through the years, these watercolor and pen and ink things. Um, and this is all done with, with rollers, paint rollers and putty knives. So each of these drawings is 18 by 24 inches. Then I scan them and put them in this sequential narrative. Okay. So these have been published, but in a different format, totally. This is one I'm working on, which is uh, the African folk tale, again, with putty knives and rollers. And it's, it's not, it's going to be panels, but right now it's just the raw art I'm throwing in, just so it has a place in here. Um, so it's, it's ongoing. And it's from a, a story from the 1800s. Um, so there's no text yet or anything. These are my original layouts. And it's gonna show a real behind the scenes because I started this back in the 90s. And then I, and again, it's like, I just, I sort of like left off of it and it was done in pen and ink in, in a way that I don't draw anymore. And so we're gonna show the originals and then have the updated version. And this was for the, uh, uh, Testament graphic novel that came out. I did the story of Abraham. We're gonna find out if we can actually reprint this or not. Um, my uh, Little Nemo for that book. This was my study for, uh, I was hit up at one point to be in the runners up for to, to do Schindler's List as a graphic novel. And uh, uh, collector just got in touch and, and has the original that I did. I'm trying to find a way to get a scan from him to finally put that, because I don't even have a photograph of it, uh, to put the original that I did from this rough. And this from the Paradox books, you know, the urban legends and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That was a poster for a Spanish festival that didn't get used because they were afraid to get sued by Hergé's widow. Uh, Unused Conan cover for Marvel. Um, Cordo Maltese. And these were the sort of uh, homages for, uh, you know, Valentina by Guido, Guido Crapax for the Fanographics editions uh, for that. And that's where it is so far. So slow but sure. <laughs> that's uh, awesome. That's exciting. I can't wait to actually have that be able to just 
it to Bay Design. It's a beautiful and, and, and impressive and inspiring body of work, George. And thank you thank for you. for sharing it with us. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Last but not least, if you want, there's. This was the other thing I wanted to try and uh, self-publish at some point, but a lot of it will maybe find its way in these other books, but it's just my sketchbooks. Um, so this get, this would give you, you know, give people, again, I tested the waters with that little, that little book. Um, so it's, uh, and it's going to be roughly the size of a moleskin. Um, let me jump down. And my sketchbooks are really just observational drawing. Um, totally, you know, well, except that that's actually like a piece. There's the original drawing, kind of a study for that cover of the other book. Um, African folktale stuff. Uh, blues, Jack Owens, um, just, you know, the Viet, uh, World War I stuff. So just sort of a mishmash, you know, but tried to organize it by subject. This was during 9-11. Some of my early illustration work. There's some of that. Anyway, just stuff. <laughs> so. Absolutely stunning. And variations of, of technique, textures, subject. Um, that is why we call you master, sir. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it pays the bills. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate your having me on. And, uh, you know, if you could send me links to some of that other stuff, I'd love to scope it all out. Absolutely, I will do. And I'm, uh, I'll, I'll put in links to your website and um, other places people can find you in the description of this when it gets archived. Cool. And uh, I will I will definitely be coming to check in on you at the um, illustra illustration passage. Cool. Uh, and hope to see you at the Academy sometime. Yeah, for sure. I, I will absolutely make it one of these times for sure. <laughs> That's great. Cool. I look forward to it. Very best to you and and uh, John and everyone at the school and your family there. And um, you guys stay safe. Take care. And I will be in touch. Wash your hands, people. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you, George.